Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two, of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Departure from the Cape of Good Hope, seventeen seventy three, January. Next day, towards noon, the gale abated so that we could carry close-reefed topsails. But the weather continued thick and hazy, with sleet and snow, which froze on the rigging as it fell, and ornamented the hull with icicles, the mercury in the thermometer being generally below the freezing point. This weather continued until near noon the next day, at which time we were in the latitude of 59 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 9 degrees 45 minutes east and here we saw some penguins. The wind had now veered to the west, and was so moderate that we could bear two reefs out of the topsails. In the afternoon we were favoured with the sight of the moon, whose face we had seen but once since we left the Cape of Good Hope. By this a judgment may be formed of the sort of weather we had since we left that place. We did not fail to seize the opportunity to make several observations of the sun and moon. The longitude deduced from it was nine degrees thirty four minutes thirty seconds east, Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time giving ten degrees six minutes east, and the latitude was fifty eight degrees fifty three minutes thirty seconds south. This longitude is nearly the same that is assigned to Cape Circumcision, and at the going down of the sun we were about ninety-five leagues to the south of the latitude it is said to lie in. At this time the weather was so clear that we might have seen land at fourteen or fifteen leagues distance. It is therefore very probable that what Bouvet took for land was nothing but mountains of ice, surrounded by loose or field ice. We ourselves were undoubtedly deceived by the ice hills the day we first fell in with the field ice nor was it an improbable conjecture that that ice joined to land. The probability was, however, now greatly lessened, if not entirely set aside, for the space between the northern edge of the ice, along which we sailed, and our route to the west, when south of it, nowhere exceeded one hundred leagues, and in some places not sixty. The clear weather continued no longer than three o'clock the next morning, when it was succeeded by a thick fog, sleet, and snow. The wind also veered to north-east and blew a fresh gale, with which we stood to south-east. It increased in such a manner that before noon we were brought under close-reefed topsails. The wind continued to veer to the north, at last fixed at north-west, and was attended with intervals of clear weather. Our course was east one quarter north, till noon the next day, when we were in the latitude of fifty-nine degrees two minutes south, and nearly under the same meridian as we were when we fell in with the last field of ice, five days before, so that, had it remained in the same situation, we must now have been in the middle of it, whereas we did not so much as see any. We cannot suppose that so large a float of ice as this was could be destroyed in so short a time. It therefore must have drifted to the northward, and this makes it probable that there is no land under this meridian, between the latitude of fifty-five degrees and fifty-nine degrees, where we had supposed some to lie, as mentioned above. As we were now only sailing over a part of the sea where we had been before, I directed the course east-south-east in order to get more to the south. We had the advantage of a fresh gale, and the disadvantage of a thick fog. Much snow and sleet, which, as usual, froze on our rigging as it fell, so that every rope was covered with the finest transparent ice I ever saw. This afforded an agreeable sight enough to the eye, but conveyed to the mind an idea of coldness much greater than it really was, for the weather was rather milder than it had been for some time past, and the sea less encumbered with ice. But the worst was, the ice so clogged the rigging, sails, and blocks, as to make them exceedingly bad to handle. 
Our people, however, surmounted these difficulties with a steady perseverance, and withstood this intense cold much better than I expected. We continued to steer to the east-south-east with a fresh gale at north-west, attended with sleet and snow till the 8th, when we were in the latitude of 61 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 31 degrees 47 minutes east. In the afternoon we passed more ice islands than we had seen for several days. Indeed, they were now so familiar to us that they were often passed unnoticed, but more generally unseen on account of the thick weather. At nine o'clock in the evening we came to one which had a quantity of loose ice about it. As the wind was moderate and the weather tolerably fair, we shortened sail and stood on and off, with a view of taking some on board on the return of light. But at four o'clock in the morning, finding ourselves to leeward of this ice, we bore down to an island to leeward of us, there being about it some loose ice, part of which we saw break off. There we brought two, hoisted out three boats, and in about five or six hours took up as much ice as yielded fifteen tons of good fresh water. The pieces we took up were hard and solid as a rock. Some of them were so large that we were obliged to break them with pickaxes before they could be taken into the boats. The salt water, which adhered to the ice, was so trifling as not to be tasted, and, after it had lain on deck for a short time, entirely drained off, and the water which the ice yielded was perfectly sweet and well tasted. Part of the ice we broke in pieces and put into casks. Some we melted in the coppers and filled up the casks with the water, and some we kept on deck for present use. The melting and stowing away the ice is a little tedious, and takes up some time. Otherwise this is the most expeditious way of watering I ever met with. Having got on board this supply of water, and the adventure about two-thirds as much, of which we stood in great need, as we had once broke the ice, I did not doubt of getting more whenever we were in want. I therefore without hesitation directed our course more to the south, with a gentle gale at north-west, attended as usual with snow-showers. In the morning of the eleventh, being then in the latitude of sixty-two degrees forty-four minutes south, longitude thirty-seven degrees east, the variation of the compass was twenty-four degrees ten minutes west, and the following morning, in the latitude of sixty-four degrees twelve minutes south, longitude thirty-eight degrees fourteen minutes east, by the mean of three compasses, it was no more than twenty-three degrees fifty-two minutes west. In this situation we saw some penguins, and being near an island of ice from which several pieces had broken, we hoisted out two boats, and took on board as much as filled all our empty casks, and the adventure did the same. While this was doing, Mr. Forster shot an albatross, whose plumage was of a colour between brown and dark grey, the head and upper side of the wings rather inclining to black, and it had white eyebrows. We began to see these birds about the time of our first falling in with the ice islands, and some have accompanied us ever since. These and the dark brown sort with the yellow bill were the only albatrosses that had not now forsaken us. At four o'clock p.m. we hoisted in the boats, and made sail to the south-east, with a gentle breeze at south by west, attended with showers of snow. On the thirteenth at two o'clock a.m. it fell calm. Of this we took the opportunity to hoist out a boat, to try the current, which we found to set northwest near one-third of a mile an hour. At the time of trying the current, a Fahrenheit's thermometer was emerged in the sea one hundred fathoms below its surface, where it remained twenty minutes. When it came up, the mercury stood at thirty-two, which is the freezing point. Some little time after, being exposed to the surface of the sea, it rose to thirty-three and a half, and in the open air to thirty-six. The calm continued till five o'clock in the evening, when it was succeeded by a light breeze from the south and south-east, 
with which we stood to the northeast, with all our sails set. Though the weather continued fair, the sky as usual was clouded. However, at nine o'clock the next morning it was clear, and we were enabled to observe several distances between the sun and moon, the mean result of which gave thirty-nine degrees thirty minutes thirty seconds east longitude. Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time gave thirty-eight degrees twenty-seven minutes forty-five seconds, which is one degree two minutes forty-five seconds west of the observations, whereas on the third instant it was half a degree east of them. In the evening I found the variation by the mean of azimuths taken with Gregory's compass to be twenty-eight degrees fourteen minutes zero seconds. By the mean of six azimuths by one of Dr. Knight's twenty-eight degrees thirty-two minutes zero seconds and by another of Dr. Knight's twenty-eight degrees thirty-four minutes zero seconds. Our latitude at this time was sixty-three degrees fifty-seven minutes, longitude thirty-nine degrees thirty-eight and a half minutes. The succeeding morning, the fifteenth, being then in latitude sixty-three degrees thirty-three minutes south, the longitude was observed by the following persons, viz. Myself, being the mean of six distances of the sun and moon, forty degrees one minute forty-five seconds east. Mr. Wales, ditto, thirty-nine degrees twenty-nine minutes forty-five seconds. Ditto, ditto, thirty-nine degrees fifty-six minutes forty-five seconds. Lieutenant Clerk, ditto, thirty-nine degrees thirty-eight minutes zero seconds. Mr. Gilbert, ditto, thirty-nine degrees forty-eight minutes forty-five seconds. Mr. Smith, ditto, thirty-nine degrees eighteen minutes fifteen seconds, mean thirty-nine degrees forty-two minutes, twelve seconds. Mr. Kendall's watch made thirty-eight degrees forty-one minutes thirty seconds, which is nearly the same difference as the day before. But Mr. Wales and I took each of us six distances of the sun and moon, with the telescopes fixed to our sextants which brought out the longitude nearly the same as the watch. The results were as follows, by Mr. Wales, 38 degrees 35 minutes 30 seconds, and by me, 38 degrees 36 minutes 45 seconds. It is impossible for me to say whether these or the former are the nearest to the truth, nor can I assign any probable reason for so great a disagreement. We certainly can observe with greater accuracy through the telescope than with the common sight, when the ship is sufficiently steady. The use of the telescope is found difficult at first, but a little practice will make it familiar. By the assistance of the watch, we shall be able to discover the greatest error this method of observing the longitude at sea is liable to, which at the present does not exceed a degree and a half and in general will be found to be much less. Such is the improvement navigation has received by the astronomers and mathematical instrument makers of this age, by the former from the valuable tables they have communicated to the public under the direction of the Board of Longitude, and contained in the astronomical ephemeris, and by the latter from the great accuracy they observe in making instruments, without which the tables would, in a great measure, lose their effect. The preceding observations were made by four different sextants of different workmen. Mine was by Mr. Bird, one of Mr. Wales's by Mr. Dolland, the other and Mr. Clerk's by Mr. Ramsden, and also Mr. Gilbert's and Smith's, who observed with the same instrument. Five tolerably fine days had now succeeded one another. This, besides giving us an opportunity to make the preceding observations, was very serviceable to us on many other accounts, and came at a very seasonable time. For, having on board a good quantity of fresh water, or ice, which was the same thing, the people were enabled to wash and dry their clothes and linen, a care 
that can never be enough attended to in all long voyages. The winds during this time blew in gentle gales, and the weather was mild. Yet the mercury in the thermometer never rose above thirty-six, and was frequently as low as the freezing point. In the afternoon, having but little wind, I brought to under an island of ice, and sent the boat to take up some. In the evening the wind freshened at east, and was attended with snow-showers and thick hazy weather, which continued a great part of the sixteenth. As we met with little ice, I stood to the south, close hauled, and at six o'clock in the evening, being in the latitude of sixty-four degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude thirty-nine degrees thirty-five minutes east, I found the variation by Gregory's compass to be twenty-six degrees forty-one minutes west. At this time the motion of the ship was so great that I could by no means observe with any of Dr. Knight's compasses. As the wind remained invariably fixed at east and east by south, I continued to stand to the south, and on the 17th between 11 and 12 o'clock we crossed the Antarctic Circle in the longitude of 39 degrees 35 minutes east, for at noon we were by observation in the latitude of 66 degrees 36 minutes 30 seconds south. The weather was now become tolerably clear, so that we could see several leagues round us, and yet we had only seen one island of ice since the morning. But about 4 p.m., as we were steering to the south, we observed the whole sea in a manner covered with ice, from the direction of south-east round to the south by west. In this space, thirty-eight ice islands, great and small, were seen, besides loose ice in abundance, so that we were obliged to luff for one piece, and bear up for another, and as we continued to advance to the south, it increased in such a manner, that at three quarters past six o'clock, being then in the latitude of sixty-seven degrees fifteen minutes south, we could proceed no farther, the ice being entirely closed to the south, in the whole extent from east to west-south-west, without the least appearance of any opening. This immense field was composed of different kinds of ice, some as high hills, loose or broken pieces packed close together, and what I think Greenland men call field ice. A float of this kind of ice lay to the south-east of us, of such extent that I could see no end to it from the masthead. It was sixteen or eighteen feet high at least, and appeared of a pretty equal height than surface. Here we saw many whales playing about the ice, and for two days before had seen several flocks of the brown and white pintados, which we named Antarctic pectorals, because they seem to be natives of that region. They are, undoubtedly, of the petrel tribe, are in every respect shaped like the pintados, differing only from them in colour. The head and fore part of the body of these are brown, and the hind part of the body, tail, and the ends of the wings are white. The white petrel also appeared in greater numbers than before, some few dark grey albatrosses, and our constant companion the blue petrel. But the common pintados had quite disappeared, as well as many other sorts, which are common in lower latitudes. End of Book One Chapter Two Part Two Chapter Three Part One of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Chapter Three sequel of the search for a southern continent between the meridian of the cape of good hope and new zealand with an account of the separation of the two ships and the arrival of the resolution in dusky bay seventeen seventy three january after meeting with this ice i did not think it was at all prudent to persevere in getting farther to the south especially as the summer was already half spent and it would have taken up some time to have got round the ice, even supposing it to have been practicable, which, however, is doubtful. 
I therefore came to a resolution to proceed directly in search of the land lately discovered by the French, and, as the winds still continued at east by south, I was obliged to return to the north, over some part of the sea I had already made myself acquainted with, and, for that reason, wished to have avoided. But this was not to be done, as our course made good, was little better than north. In the night the wind increased to a strong gale, attended with sleet and snow, and obliged us to double-reef our topsails. About noon the next day the gale abated, so that we could bear all our reefs out, but the wind still remained in its old water. In the evening, being in the latitude of 64 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 40 degrees 15 minutes east, a bird, called by us in my former voyage Port Egmont Hen, on account of the great plenty of them at Port Egmont in Falkland Isles, came hovering several times over the ship, and then left us in the direction of north-east. They are a short thick bird about the size of a large crow, of a dark brown or chocolate colour, with a whitish streak under each wing in the shape of a half-moon. I have been told that these birds are found in great plenty at the Faroe Isles north of Scotland, and that they never go far from land. Certain it is, I never before saw them above forty leagues off, but I do not remember ever seeing fewer than two together, whereas here was but one, which, with the islands of ice, may have come a good way from land. At nine o'clock the wind veering to east-north-east, we tacked and stood to the south-south-east, but at four in the morning of the twentieth it returned back to its old point, and we resumed our northerly course. One of the above birds was seen this morning, probably the same we saw the night before, as our situation was not much altered. As the day advanced the gale increased, attended with thick hazy weather, sleet and snow, and at last obliged us to close reef our topsails and strike topgallant yards. But in the evening the wind abated, so as to admit us to carry whole topsails and topgallant yards aloft. Hazy weather with snow and sleet continued. In the afternoon of the 21st, being in the latitude of 62 degrees 24 minutes south, longitude 42 degrees 19 minutes east, we saw a white albatross with black-tipped wings and a pintado bird. The wind was now at south and southwest a fresh gale. With this we steered northeast against a very high sea, which did not indicate the vicinity of land in that quarter, and yet it was there we were to expect it. The next day we had intervals of fair weather. The wind was moderate, and we carried our studding sails. In the morning of the 23rd, we were in latitude of 60 degrees 27 minutes south, longitude 45 degrees 33 minutes east. Snow showers continued, and the weather was so cold that the water in our water vessels on deck had been frozen for several preceding nights. Having clear weather at intervals, I spread the ships abreast four miles from each other, in order the better to discover anything that might lie in our way. We continued to sail in this manner till six o'clock in the evening, when hazy weather and snow showers made it necessary for us to join. We kept our course to north-east till eight o'clock in the morning of the 25th, when the wind having veered round to north-east by east, by the west and north we tacked, and stood to north-west. The wind was fresh, and yet we made but little way against a high northerly sea. We now began to see some of that sort of petrels so well known to sailors by the name of shearwaters, latitude 58 degrees 10 minutes, longitude 50 degrees 54 minutes east. In the afternoon the wind veered to the southward of east, and at eight o'clock in the evening it increased to a storm attended with thick hazy weather, sleet and snow. During night we went under our foresail and main topsail close reefed. At daylight the next morning added to them the fore and mizzen topsails. 
At four o'clock it fell calm, but a prodigious high sea from the northeast, and a complication of the worst of weather, viz., snow, sleet, and rain continued, together with the calm till nine o'clock in the evening. Then the weather cleared up and we got a breeze at southeast by south. With this we steered north by east till eight o'clock the next morning, being the twenty-seventh, when I spread the ships and steered north-north-east, all sails set, having a fresh breeze at south by west and clear weather. At noon we were by observation in the latitude of fifty-six degrees twenty-eight minutes south, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun and moon appearing at intervals, their distances were observed by the following persons, and the longitude resulting therefrom was, by Mr. Wales, the mean of two sets, fifty degrees fifty-nine minutes east, Lieutenant Clerk, fifty-one degrees eleven minutes, Mr. Gilbert, fifty degrees fourteen minutes, Mr. Smith, fifty degrees fifty minutes, Mr. Kendall's watch, fifty degrees fifty minutes. At six o'clock in the evening, being in latitude fifty-six degrees nine minutes south, I now made signal to the adventure to come under my stern, and at eight o'clock the next morning sent her to look out on my starboard beam, having at this time a fresh gale at west and pretty clear weather. But this was not of long duration, for, at two in the afternoon, the sky became cloudy and hazy, the wind increased to a fresh gale, blew in squalls attended with snow, sleet, and drizzling rain. I now made signal to the adventure to come under my stern, and took another reef in each topsail. At eight o'clock I hauled up the mainsail, and run all night under the foresail, and two topsails, our course being north-north-east and north-east by north, with a strong gale at north-west. The twenty-ninth at noon we observed in latitude fifty-two degrees twenty-nine minutes south, the weather being fair and tolerably clear. But in the afternoon it again became very thick and hazy with rain, and the gale increased in such a manner as to oblige us to strike top-gallant yards, close reef and hand the topsails. We spent part of the night, which was very dark and stormy, in making a tack to the south-west, and in the morning of the thirtieth stood again to the north-east, wind at north-west and north a very fresh gale which split several of our small sails. This day no ice was seen, probably owing to the thick hazy weather. At eight o'clock in the evening we tacked and stood to the westward under our courses, but as the sea ran high we made our course no better than south-south-west. At four o'clock the next morning the gale had a little abated, and the wind had backed to west by south. We again stood to the northward under courses and double reef topsails, having a very high sea from the north-north-west, which gave us but little hopes of finding the land we were in search of. At noon we were in the latitude of fifty degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude fifty-six degrees forty-eight minutes east, and presently after we saw two islands of ice. One of these we passed very near, and found that it was breaking or falling to pieces by the crackling noise it made which was equal to the report of a four-pounder. There was a good deal of loose ice about it, and had the weather been favourable, I should have brought to and taken some up. After passing this we saw no more, till we returned again to the south. 1773 February Hazy gloomy weather continued, and the wind remained invariably fixed at north-west so that we could make our course no better than north-east by north, and by this course we held until four o'clock in the afternoon of the 1st of February, being then in the latitude of 48 degrees 30 minutes, and longitude 58 degrees 7 minutes east, nearly in the meridian of the island of Mauritius, and where we were to expect to find the land said to be discovered by the French, of which at this time we saw not the least signs, we bore away east. I now made the signal to the adventure to keep at the distance of four miles on my starboard beam. At half an hour past six, Captain Furneaux made the signal to speak with me, and upon his coming under my stern, he informed me that he had just seen a large float of sea or rockweed, 
and about it several birds, divers. These were certainly signs of the vicinity of land, but whether it lay to the east or west was not possible for us to know. My intention was to have got into this latitude four or five degrees of longitude to the west of the meridian we were in, and then to have carried on my researches to the east. But the west and north-west winds we had had for the five preceding days prevented me from putting this in execution. The continual high sea we had lately had from the north-east, north, north-west, and west, left me no reason to believe that land of any extent lay to the west. We therefore continued to steer to the east, only lying to a few hours in the night, and in the morning resumed our course again, four miles north and south from each other, the hazy weather not permitting us to spread farther. We passed two or three small pieces of rock-weed, and saw two or three birds known by the name of egg-birds, but saw no other signs of land. At noon we observed in latitude 48 degrees 36 minutes south, longitude 59 degrees 35 minutes east, as we could see only a few miles farther to the south, and as it was not impossible that there might be land not far off in that direction, I gave orders to steer south a half east, and made the signal for the adventure to follow, she being by this movement thrown astern. The weather continuing hazy till half an hour past six o'clock in the evening, when it cleared up so as to enable us to see about five leagues round us. Being now in the latitude of forty-nine degrees thirteen minutes south, without having the least signs of land, I wore and stood again to the eastward, and soon after spoke with Captain Furneaux. He told me that he thought the land was to the north-west of us, as he had at one time observed the sea to be smooth when the wind blew in that direction. Although this was not conformable to the remarks we had made on the sea, I resolved to clear up the point, if the wind would admit of my getting to the west in any reasonable time. At eight o'clock in the morning of the third, being in the latitude of forty-eight degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude sixty degrees forty-seven minutes east, and upwards of eight degrees to the east of the meridian of the Mauritius, I began to despair of finding land to the east, and as the wind had now veered to the north, resolved to search for it to the west. I accordingly tacked and stood to the west with a fresh gale. This increased in such a manner that, before night, we were reduced to our two courses, and at last obliged to lie to under the foresails, having a prodigious high sea from west-north-west, notwithstanding the height of the gale, was from north by west. At three o'clock the next morning, the gale abating, we made sail, and continued to ply to the west till ten o'clock in the morning of the sixth. At this time, being in the latitude of forty-eight degrees six minutes south, longitude fifty-eight degrees twenty-two minutes east, the wind seemingly fixed at west-north-west, and seeing no signs of meeting with land, I gave over plying, and bore away east a little southerly. Being satisfied that if there is any land hereabout, it can only be an isle of no great extent, and it was just as probable I might have found it to the east as to the west. While we were plying about here, we took every opportunity to observe the variation of the compass, and found it to be from twenty-seven degrees fifty minutes to thirty degrees twenty-six minutes west, probably the mean of the two extremes, viz. twenty-nine degrees four minutes, is the nearest of the truth, as it nearly agrees with the variation observed on board the adventure. In making these observations we found that, when the sun was on the larboard side of the ship, the variation was the least, and when on the starboard side the greatest. This was not the first time we had made this observation, without being able to account for it. At four o'clock in the morning of the seventh, I made the adventure signal to keep at a distance of four miles on my starboard beam, and continued to steer east-south-east. This being a fine day, I had all our men's bedding and clothes spread on deck to air, and the ship cleaned and smoked betwixt decks. At noon I steered a point more to the south, 
being then in the latitude of 45 degrees 49 minutes south, longitude 61 degrees 48 minutes east. At six o'clock in the evening I called in the adventure, and at the same time took several azimuths, which gave the variation 31 degrees 28 minutes west. These observations could not be taken with the greatest accuracy, on account of the rolling of the ship, occasioned by a very high westerly swell. The preceding evening three Port Egmont hens were seen. This morning another appeared. In the evening and several times in the night penguins were heard, and at daylight in the morning of the 8th several of these were seen, and divers of two sorts, seemingly such as are usually met with on the coast of England. This occasioned us to sound, but we found no ground with a line of 210 fathoms. Our latitude was now 49 degrees 53 minutes south, and longitude 63 degrees 39 minutes east. This was at 8 o'clock. By this time the wind had veered round by the northeast to east, blew a brisk gale, and was attended with hazy weather, which soon after turned to a thick fog, and at the same time the wind shifted to northeast. I continued to keep the wind on the larboard tack, and to fire a gun every hour till noon, when I made the signal to tack and tacked accordingly. But as neither this signal nor any of the former was answered by the adventure, we had but too much reason to think that a separation had taken place, though we were at a loss to tell how it had been effected. I had directed Captain Forneau, in case he was separated from me, to cruise three days in the place where he last saw me. I therefore continued making short boards and firing half-hour guns, till the ninth in the afternoon, when, the weather having cleared up, we could see several leagues round us, and found that the adventure was not within the limits of our horizon. At this time we were about two or three leagues to the eastward of the situation we were in when we last saw her, and were standing to the northwest with a very strong gale at north-northwest, accompanied with a great sea from the same direction. This, together with an increase of wind, obliged us to lie to till eight o'clock the next morning, during which time we saw nothing of the adventure, notwithstanding the weather was pretty clear, and we had kept firing guns and burning false fires all night. I therefore gave over looking for her, made sail and steered south-east, with a very fresh gale at west by north, accompanied with a high sea from the same direction. While we were beating about here, we frequently saw penguins and divers, which made us conjecture the land was not far off, but in what direction it was not possible for us to tell. As we advanced to the south, we lost the penguins and most of the divers and, as usual, met with abundance of albatrosses, blue petrels, sheer waters, etc. The eleventh at noon, and in a latitude of 51 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 67 degrees 20 minutes east, we again met with penguins, and saw an egg-bird, which we also look upon to be a sign of the vicinity of land. I continued to steer to the south-east, with a fresh gale in the north-west quarter, attended with a long hollow swell, and frequent showers of rain, hail, and snow. The twelfth in the morning, being in the latitude of 52 degrees 32 minutes south, longitude 69 degrees 47 minutes east, the variation was 31 degrees 38 minutes west. In the evening, in the latitude of 53 degrees 7 minutes south, longitude 70 degrees 50 minutes east, it was thirty-two degrees thirty minutes, and the next morning, in the latitude of fifty-three degrees thirty-seven minutes south, longitude seventy-two degrees ten minutes, it was thirty-three degrees eight minutes west. Thus far we had continually a great number of penguins about the ship, which seemed to be different from those we had seen near the ice, being smaller, with reddish bills and brownish heads. The meeting with so many of these birds gave us some hopes of finding land, and occasioned various conjectures about its situation. The great westerly swell which still continued made it improbable that land of any considerable extent lay to the west, nor was it very probable that any lay to the north, 
as we were only about a hundred and sixty leagues to the south of Tasman's track in 1642, and I conjectured that Captain Furneaux would explore this place, which accordingly happened. In the evening we saw Port Egmont Hen, which flew away in the direction of northeast by east, and the next morning a seal was seen, but no penguins. In the evening, being in the latitude of 55 degrees 49 minutes south, longitude 75 degrees 52 minutes east, the variation was 34 degrees 48 minutes west, and in the evening of the 15th, in latitude 57 degrees 2 minutes south, longitude 79 degrees 56 minutes east, it was 38 degrees west. Five seals were seen this day, and a few penguins which occasioned us to sound, without finding any bottom, with a line of a hundred and fifty fathoms. At daylight, in the morning of the sixteenth, we saw an island of ice to the northward, for which we steered in order to take some on board, but the wind shifting in that direction hindered us from putting this in execution. At this time we were in the latitude of fifty-seven degrees eight minutes south, longitude eighty degrees fifty nine minutes east and had two islands of ice in sight this morning we saw one penguin which appeared to be of the same sort which we had formerly seen near the ice but we had now been so often deceived by these birds that we could no longer look upon them nor indeed upon any other oceanic birds which frequent high latitudes as sure signs of the vicinity of land the wind continued not long at north, but veered to east by northeast, and blew a gentle gale, with which we stood to the southward, having frequent showers of sleet and snow. But in the night we had fair weather, and a clear serene sky, and between midnight and three o'clock in the morning, lights were seen in the heavens, similar to those in the northern hemisphere, known by the name of Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights but I never heard of the Aurora Australia being seen before. The officer of the watch observed that it sometimes broke out in spiral rays and in a circular form. Then its light was very strong and its appearance beautiful. He could not perceive it had any particular direction, for it appeared at various times in different parts of the heavens and diffused its light throughout the whole atmosphere. At nine o'clock in the morning, we bore down to an island of ice which we reached by noon. It was full half a mile in circuit and two hundred feet high at least, though very little loose ice about it. But while we were considering whether or not we should hoist out our boats to take some up, a great quantity broke from the island. Upon this we hoisted out our boats and went to work to get some on board. The pieces of ice, both great and small, which broke from the island, I observed, drifted fast to the westward. That is, they left the island in that direction, and were, in a few hours, spread over a large space of sea. This, I have no doubt, was caused by a current setting in that direction, for the wind could have but little effect upon the ice, especially as there was a large hollow swell from the west. This circumstance greatly retarded our taking up ice. We, however, made a shift to get on board about nine or ten tons before eight o'clock, when we hoisted in the boats and made sail to the east, inclining to the south, with a fresh gale at south, which soon after veered to south-south-west and south-west, with fair but cloudy weather. This course brought us among many ice isles, so that it was necessary to proceed with great caution, in the night the mercury in the thermometer fell two degrees below the freezing point, and the water in the scuttle casks on deck was frozen. As I have not taken notice of the thermometer of late, I shall now observe that as we advanced to the north, the mercury gradually rose to forty-five and fell again, as we advanced to the south, to what is above mentioned, nor did it rise in the middle of the day to above thirty-four or thirty-five. In the morning of the 18th, being in the latitude of 57 degrees 54 minutes south, longitude 83 degrees 14 minutes east, the variation was 39 degrees 33 minutes west. 
in the evening in latitude 58 degrees 2 minutes south, longitude 84 degrees 35 minutes east, it was only 37 degrees 8 minutes west, which induced me to believe it was decreasing, but in the evening of the 20th, in the latitude of 58 degrees 47 minutes south, longitude 90 degrees 56 minutes east, I took nine azimuths with Dr. Knight's compass, which gave the variation 40 degrees 7 minutes, and nine others with Gregory's, which gave 40 degrees 15 minutes west. This day at noon, being nearly in the latitude and longitude just mentioned, we thought we saw land to the south-west. The appearance was so strong that we doubted not it was there in reality, and tacked to work up to it accordingly, having a light breeze at south and clear weather. We were, however, soon undeceived, by finding that it was only clouds, which in the evening entirely disappeared, and left us a clear horizon so that we could see a considerable way round us, in which space nothing was to be seen but ice islands. In the night the aurora australis made a very brilliant and luminous appearance. It was seen first in the east a little above the horizon, and in a short time spread over the whole heavens. The twenty-first in the morning, having little wind and a smooth sea, two favourable circumstances for taking up ice, I steered for the largest ice island before us, which we reached by noon. At this time we were in the latitude of 59 degrees south, longitude 92 degrees 30 minutes east, having about two hours before seen three or four penguins. Finding here a good quantity of loose ice, I ordered two boats out and sent them to take some on board. While this was doing, the island which was not less than half a mile in circuit and three or four hundred feet high above the surface of the sea, turned nearly bottom up. Its height, by this circumstance, was neither increased nor diminished apparently. As soon as we had got on board as much ice we, as we could dispose of, we hoisted in the boats and made sail to the southeast, with a gentle breeze at north by east, attended with showers of snow and dark gloomy weather. At this time we had but few ice islands in sight, but the next day seldom less than twenty or thirty were seen at once. The wind gradually veered to the east, and at last, fixing it east by south, blew a fresh gale. With this we stood to the south till eight o'clock in the evening of the twenty-third, at which time we were in the latitude of sixty-one degrees fifty-two minutes south, longitude ninety-five degrees two minutes east. We now tacked and spent the night, which was exceedingly stormy, thick and hazy, with sleet and snow, in making short boards. Surrounded on every side with danger, it was natural for us to wish for daylight. This, when it came, served only to increase our apprehensions, by exhibiting to our view those huge mountains of ice, which in the night we had passed without seeing. These unfavourable circumstances, together with dark nights at this advanced season of the year, quite discouraged me from putting in execution a resolution I had taken of crossing the Antarctic Circle once more. Accordingly, at four o'clock in the morning we stood to the north, with a very hard gale at east-south-east, accompanied with sleet and snow, and a very high sea from the same point, which made great destruction among the ice islands. This circumstance, far from being of any advantage to us, greatly increased the number of pieces we had to avoid. The large pieces which break from the ice islands are much more dangerous than the islands themselves. The latter are so high out of water that we can generally see them, unless the weather be very thick and dark, before we are very near them, whereas the others cannot be seen in the night till they are under our ship's bows. These dangers were, however, now become so familiar to us that the apprehensions they caused were never of long duration, and were in some measure compensated both by the seasonable supplies of fresh water these ice islands afforded us, without which we must have been greatly distressed, and also by their very romantic appearance, greatly heightened by the foaming and dashing of the waves into the curious holes and caverns which are formed in many of them, the whole exhibiting a view which at once filled the mind with admiration and horror, 
and can only be described by the hand of an able painter. Towards the evening the gale abated, and in the night we had two or three hours calm. This was succeeded by a light breeze at west, with which we steered east, under all the sail we could set, meeting with many ice islands. This night we saw a port Egmont hen, and next morning being the twenty-fifth another. We had lately seen but few birds, and these were albatrosses, sheer waters, and blue petrels. It is remarkable that we did not see one of either the white or Antarctic petrels, since we came last among the ice. Notwithstanding the wind kept it west and northwest all day, we had a very high sea from the east, by which we concluded that no land could be near in that direction. In the evening, being in the latitude 60 degrees 51 minutes, longitude 95 degrees 41 minutes east, the variation was 43 degrees 6 minutes west, and the next morning being the 26th, having advanced about a degree and a half more to the east, it was 41 degrees 30 minutes, both being determined by several azimuths. We had fair weather all the afternoon, but the wind was unsettled, veering round by the north to the east. With this we stood to the south-east and east till three o'clock in the afternoon, when, being in the latitude of sixty-one degrees twenty-one minutes south, longitude ninety-seven degrees seven minutes east, we tacked and stood to the northward and eastward, as the wind kept veering to the south. This in the evening increased to a strong gale, blew in squalls, attended with snow and sleet, and thick hazy weather, which soon brought us under our close reef topsails. Between eight in the morning of the twenty-sixth and noon the next day, we fell in among several islands of ice, from whence such vast quantities had broken as to cover the sea all round us, and render sailing rather dangerous. However, by noon we were clear of it all. In the evening the wind abated and veered to south-west, but the weather did not clear up till the next morning, when we were able to carry all our sails, and met with but very few islands of ice to impede us. Probably the late gale had destroyed a great number of them. Such a very large hollow sea had continued to accompany the wind as it veered from east to south-west, that I was certain no land of considerable extent could lie within a hundred or a hundred and fifty leagues of our situation between these two points. The mean height of the thermometer at noon, for several days past, was at about thirty-five, which is something higher than it usually was in the same latitude, about a month or five weeks before. Consequently the air was something warmer. While the weather was really warm, the gales were not only stronger, but more frequent, with almost continual misty, dirty, wet weather. The very animals we had on board felt its effects, a sow having in the morning farrowed nine pigs, every one of them was killed by the cold before four o'clock in the afternoon, notwithstanding all the care we could take of them. From the same cause, myself as well as several of my people, had fingers and toes chilblained. Such is the summer weather we enjoyed. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part One One chapter three part two of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume one by james cook this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by david cole medway massachusetts chapter three sequel of the search for a southern continent between the meridian of the cape of good hope and new zealand with an account of the separation of the two ships and the arrival of the resolution in dusky bay part two seventeen seventy three march the wind continued unsettled veering from the south to the west and blew a fresh gale till the evening then it fell little wind and soon after a breeze sprung up at north which quickly veered to northeast and northeast by east attended with a thick fog snow, sleet, and rain. With this wind and weather, we kept on to the south-east, 
till four o'clock in the afternoon of the next day, being the first of March, when it fell calm, which continued for near twenty-four hours. We were now in the latitude of sixty degrees thirty-six minutes south, longitude one o seven degrees fifty-four minutes, and had a prodigious high swell from the south-west, and at the same time another from the south or south-south-east. The dashing of the one wave against the other made the ship both roll and pitch exceedingly, but at length the north-west swell prevailed. The calm continued till noon the next day, when it was succeeded by a gentle breeze from south-east, which afterwards increased and veered to south-west. With this we steered north-east by east and east by north, under all the sail we could set. In the afternoon of the third, being in latitude sixty degrees thirteen minutes, longitude one hundred and ten degrees eighteen minutes, the variation was thirty-nine degrees four minutes west. But the observations by which this was determined were none of the best, being obliged to make use of such as we could get, during the very few and short intervals when the sun appeared. A few penguins were seen this day, but not so many islands of ice as usual. The weather was also milder, though very changeable, thermometer from 36 to 38. We continued to have a north-west swell, although the wind was unsettled, veering to north-west by the west and north, attended with hazy sleet and drizzling rain. We prosecuted our course to the east, inclining to the south, till three o'clock in the afternoon of the fourth, when, being in the latitude of sixty degrees thirty-seven minutes, longitude one hundred and thirteen degrees twenty-four minutes, the wind shifting at once to south-west and south-west by south, I gave orders to steer east by north a half north, but in the night we steered east a half south, in order to have the wind, which was at south-south-west, more upon the beam the better to enable us to stand back, in case we fell in with any danger in the dark, for we had not so much time to spare to allow us to lie to. In the morning of the fifth we steered east by north, under all the sail we could set, passing one ice island and many small pieces, and at nine o'clock the wind, which of late had not remained long up any one point, shifted all at once to east and blew a gentle gale. With this we stood to the north, at which time we were in the latitude of sixty degrees forty-four minutes south, and longitude one hundred and sixteen degrees fifty minutes east. The latitude was determined by the meridian altitude of the sun, which appeared now and then for a few minutes, till three in the afternoon. Indeed the sky was in general so cloudy, and the weather so thick and hazy, that we had very little benefit of sun or moon very seldom seeing the face of either the one or the other. And yet, even under these circumstances, the weather for some days past could not be called very cold. It, however, had not the least pretension to be called summer weather, according to my ideas of summer in the northern hemisphere, so far as sixty degrees of latitude, which is nearly as far north as I have been. In the evening we had three islands of ice in sight, all of them large, especially one which was larger than any we had yet seen. The side opposed to us seemed to be a mile in extent, if so it could not be less than three in circuit. As we passed it in the night a continual cracking was heard, occasioned, no doubt, by pieces breaking from it. For, in the morning of the sixth, the sea, for some distance round it, was covered with large and small pieces, and the island itself did not appear so large as it had done the evening before. It could not be less than one hundred feet high, yet such was the impetuous force and height of the waves which were broken against it by meeting with such a sudden resistance, that they rose considerably higher. In the evening we were in latitude of fifty-nine degrees fifty-eight minutes south, longitude 118 degrees 39 minutes east. The seventh, the wind was variable in the northeast and southeast quarters, 
attended with snow and sleet till the evening. Then the weather became fair, the sky cleared up, and the night was remarkably pleasant, as well as the morning of the next day, which, for the brightness of the sky, and serenity and mildness of the weather, gave place to none we had seen since we left the Cape of Good Hope. It was such as is little known in this sea, and to make it still more agreeable, we had not one island of ice in sight. The mercury in the thermometer rose to forty degrees. Mr. Wales and the master made some observations of the moon and stars, which satisfied us that, when our latitude was fifty-nine degrees forty-four minutes, our longitude was a hundred and twenty-one degrees nine minutes. At three o'clock in the afternoon, the calm was succeeded by a breeze at south-east. The sky at the same time was suddenly obscured, and seemed to presage an approaching storm, which accordingly happened. For, in the evening, the wind shifted to south, blew in squalls, attended with sleet and rain, and a prodigious high sea. Having nothing to take care of but ourselves, we kept two or three points from the wind, and ran at a good rate to the east-north-east under our two courses and close reef topsails. The gale continued till the evening of the tenth. Then it abated, the wind shifted to the westward, and we had fair weather and but little wind during the night, attended with a sharp frost. The next morning, being in the latitude of fifty-seven degrees fifty-six minutes, longitude one hundred and thirty degrees, the wind shifted to north-east and blew a fresh gale, with which we stood south-east, having frequent showers of snow and sleet, and a long hollow swell from south-south-east and south-east by south. This swell did not go down till two days after the wind which raised it had not only ceased to blow, but had shifted and blown fresh at opposite points, good part of the time. Whoever attentively considers this must conclude that there can be no land to the south, but what must be at a great distance. Notwithstanding so little was to be expected in that quarter, we continued to stand to the south till three o'clock in the morning of the twelfth, when we were stopped by a calm, being then in the latitude of fifty-eight degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude 131 degrees 26 minutes east. After a few hours calm a breeze sprung up at west, with which we steered east. The south-south-east swell having gone down, was succeeded by another from north-west by west. The weather continued mild all this day, and the mercury rose to thirty-nine and a half. In the evening it fell calm, and continued so till three o'clock in the morning of the thirteenth, when we got the wind at east and south-east, a fresh breeze attended with snow and sleet. In the afternoon it became fair, and the wind veered round to the south and south-south-west. In the evening, being in the latitude of fifty-eight degrees fifty-nine minutes, longitude one hundred and thirty-four degrees, the weather was so clear in the horizon that we could see many leagues round us, we had but little wind during the night, some showers of snow, and a very sharp frost. As the day broke, the wind freshened at south-east and south-south-east, and soon after the sky cleared up, and the weather became clear and serene, but the air continued cold, and the mercury in the thermometer rose only one degree above the freezing point. The clear weather gave Mr. Wales an opportunity to get some observations of the sun and moon. Their results reduced to noon, when the latitude was fifty-eight degrees twenty-two minutes south, gave us one hundred and thirty-six degrees twenty-two minutes east longitude. Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time gave one thirty-four degrees forty-two minutes, and that of Mr. Arnold the same. This was the first and only time they pointed out the same longitude since we left England. The greatest difference, however, between them, since we left the Cape, had not much exceeded two degrees. The moderate, and I might almost say pleasant weather, which we had at times for the last two or three days, made me wish I had been a few degrees of latitude further south, and even tempted me to incline our course that way. But we soon had weather which convinced us 
that we were full far enough, and that the time was approaching when these seas were not to be navigated without enduring intense cold, which, by the by, we were pretty well used to. In the afternoon the serenity of the sky was presently obscured. The wind veered round to the south-west to west, and blew in hard squalls, attended with thick and heavy showers of hail and snow, which continually covered our deck sails and rigging till five o'clock in the evening of the fifteenth. At this time the wind abated and shifted to south-east, the sky cleared up and the evening was so serene and clear that we could see many leagues round us, the horizon being the only boundary to our sight. We were now in the latitude of 59 degrees 17 minutes south, longitude 140 degrees 12 minutes east, and had such a large hollow swell from west-south-west as assured us that we had left no land behind us in that direction. I was also well assured that no land lay to the south on this side of sixty degrees of latitude. We had a smart frost during the night, which was curiously illuminated with the southern lights. At ten o'clock in the morning of the sixteenth, which was as soon as the sun appeared, in the latitude of fifty-eight degrees fifty-one minutes south, our longitude was one forty-four degrees ten minutes east. This good weather was as usual of short duration. In the afternoon of this day we had again thick snow showers, but at intervals it was tolerably clear, and in the evening being in the latitude of fifty-eight degrees fifty-eight minutes south, longitude one forty-four degrees thirty-seven minutes east, I found the variation by several azimuths to be thirty-one minutes east. I was not a little pleased with being able to determine, with so much precision, this point of the line, in which the compass had no variation. For I look upon half a degree as next to nothing, so that the intersection of the latitude and longitude just mentioned may be reckoned the point without any sensible error. At any rate, the line can only pass a very small matter west of it. I continued to steer to the east, inclining to the south, with a fresh gale at south-west, till five o'clock the next morning, when, being in the latitude of fifty-nine degrees seven minutes south, longitude one forty-six degrees fifty-three minutes east, I bore away north-east, and, at noon, north, having come to a resolution to quit the high southern latitudes, and to proceed to New Zealand to look for the adventure, and to refresh my people. I had also some thoughts, and even a desire to visit the east coast of Van Diemen's Land, in order to satisfy myself if he joined the coast of New South Wales. In the night of the 17th the wind shifted to north-west and blew in squalls, attended with thick hazy weather and rain. This continued all the 18th, in the evening of which day, being in the latitude of 56 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 150 degrees, the sky cleared up, and we found the variation by several azimuths to be 13 degrees 30 minutes east. Soon after we hauled up with a log a piece of rockweed, which was in a state of decay and covered with barnacles. In the night the southern lights were very bright. The next morning we saw a seal, and towards noon some penguins and more rockweed, being at this time in the latitude of fifty-five degrees one minute, longitude one fifty-two degrees one minute east. In the latitude of fifty-four degrees four minutes, we also saw a port Egmont Hen and some weed. Navigators have generally looked upon all these to be certain signs of the vicinity of land. I cannot, however, support this opinion. At this time we knew of no land, nor is it even probable that there is any, nearer than New Holland or Van Diemen's Land, from which we were distant two hundred and sixty leagues. We had at the same time several porpoises playing about us, into one of which Mr. Cooper struck a harpoon, but as the ship was running seven knots it broke its hold, after towing it some minutes, and before we could deaden the ship's way. As the wind, which continued between the north and the west, would not permit me to touch at Van Diemen's land, I shaped my course to New Zealand, 
and being under no apprehensions of meeting with any danger, I was not backward in carrying sail, as well by night as day, having the advantage of a very strong gale, which was attended with hazy rainy weather, and a very large swell from the west and west-south-west. We continue to meet with, now and then, a seal, port Egmont hens, and seaweed. On the morning of the 22nd the wind shifted to south, and brought with it fair weather. At noon we found ourselves in the latitude of 49 degrees 55 minutes, longitude 159 degrees 28 minutes, having a very large swell out of the south-west. For the three days past the mercury in the thermometer had risen to forty-six, and the weather was quite mild. Seven or eight degrees of latitude had made a surprising difference in the temperature of the air, which we felt with an agreeable satisfaction. We continued to advance to the northeast at a good rate, having a brisk gale between the south and east, meeting with seals, port Egmont hens, egg birds, seaweed, etc., and having constantly a very large swell from the south-west. At ten o'clock in the morning of the twenty-fifth, the land of New Zealand was seen from the masthead, and at noon from the deck, extending from north-east by east to east, distant ten leagues. As I intended to put into Dusky Bay, or any other port I could find, on the southern part of Tavai Pernanamu, we steered in for the land, under all the sail we could carry, having the advantage of a fresh gale at west and tolerably clear weather. This last was not of long duration, for, at half an hour after four o'clock, the land, which was not above four miles distant, was in a manner wholly obscured in a thick haze. At this time we were before the entrance of a bay, which I had mistaken for Dusky Bay, being deceived by some islands that lay in the mouth of it. Fearing to run, in thick weather, into a place to which we were all strangers, and seeing some breakers and broken ground ahead, I tacked in twenty-five fathom water, and stood out to sea with the wind at north-west. This bay lies on the south-east side of Cape West, and may be known by a white cliff on one of the isles which lies in the entrance of the bay. This part of the coast I did not see but at a great distance, in my former voyage, and we now saw it under so many disadvantageous circumstances, that the less I say about it, the fewer mistakes I shall make. We stood out to sea under close-reefed topsails and courses till eleven o'clock at night, when we wore and stood to the northward, having a very high and irregular sea. At five o'clock next morning the gale abated, and we bore up for the land. At eight o'clock the west cape bore east by north a half north, for which we steered, and entered Dusky Bay about noon. In the entrance of it we found forty-four fathoms water, a sandy bottom, the west cape bearing south-south-east, and five fingers point, on the, or the north point of the bay, north. Here we had a great swell rolling in from the south-west. The depth of water decreased to forty fathoms, afterwards we had no ground with sixty. We were, however, too far advanced to return, and therefore stood on, not doubting but that we should find anchorage. For in this bay we were all strangers, in my former voyage having done no more than discover and name it. After running about two leagues up the bay and passing several of the isles which lay in it, I brought two, and hoisted out two boats one of which I sent away with an officer round a point on the larboard hand to look for anchorage. This he found and signified the same by signal. We then followed with the ship and anchored in fifty fathoms water, so near the shore as to reach it with an hawser. This was on Friday the 26th of March, at three in the afternoon, after having been one hundred and seventeen days at sea, in which time we had sailed three thousand six hundred leagues, without having once sight of land. After such a long continuance at sea in a high southern latitude, it is but reasonable to think that many of my people must be ill of the scurvy. The contrary, however, happened. Mention hath already been made of sweet wort being given to such as were scorbutic. 
This had so far the desired effect that we had only one man on board that could be called very ill of this disease, occasioned chiefly by a bad habit of body and a complication of other disorders. We did not attribute the general good state of health in the crew wholly to the sweet wort, but to the frequent airing and sweetening the ship by fires, etc. We must also allow portable broth and sauerkraut to have had some share in it. This last can never be enough recommended. My first care after the ship was moored was to send a boat and people a-fishing. In the meantime some of the gentlemen killed a seal, out of many that were upon a rock, which made us a fresh meal. End of chapter 3, part 2「Chapter Four, Part One of Volume One of A Voyage Towards the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World. Volume One by James Cook. Book One, Chapter Four, Part One. Transactions in Dusky Bay, with an account of several interviews with the inhabitants. 1773 March. As I did not like the place we were anchored in, I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill over to the southeast side of the bay to search for a better and I went myself to the other side for the same purpose, where I met with an exceedingly snug harbour, but nothing else worthy of note. Mr. Pickersgill reported, upon his return, that he had found a good harbour with every conveniency. As I liked the situation of this better than the other of my own finding, I determined to go there in the morning. The fishing-boat was very successful returning with fish sufficient for all hands for supper, and, in a few hours in the morning, caught as many as served for dinner. This gave us certain hopes of being plentifully supplied with this article. Nor did the shores and woods appear less destitute of wild fowl, so that we hoped to enjoy with ease what in our situation might be called the luxuries of life. This determined me to stay for some time in this bay, in order to examine it thoroughly, as no one had ever landed before on any of the southern parts of this country. On the twenty-seventh at nine o'clock in the morning we got under sail with a light breeze at south-west, and, working over to Pickersgill Harbour, entered it by a channel scarcely twice the width of the ship, and in a small creek moored head and stern, so near the shore as to reach it with a brow or stage, which nature had in the manner prepared for us in a large tree, whose end or top reached our gunwale. Wood for fuel and other purposes was here so convenient that our yards were locked in the branches of the trees, and about one hundred yards from our stern was a fine stream of fresh water. Thus situated we began to clear places in the woods, in order to set up the astronomer's observatory, the forge to repair our ironwork, tents for the sailmakers and coopers to repair the sails and casks in, to land our empty casks to fill water and to cut down wood for fuel, all of which were absolutely necessary occupations. We also began to brew beer from the branches or leaves of a tree, which much resembles the American black spruce. From the knowledge I had of this tree, and the similarity it bore to the spruce, I judged that, with the addition of inspissated juice of wort and molasses, it would make a very wholesome beer, and supply the want of vegetables which this place did not afford, and the event proved that I was not mistaken. Now I have mentioned the inspissated juice of wort, it will not be amiss in this place to inform the reader that I had made several trials of it since I left the Cape of Good Hope, and found it to answer in a cold climate beyond all expectation. 
the juice diluted in warm water in the proportion of twelve parts water to one part juice made a very good and well tasted small beer some juice which i had of mr pelham's own preparing would bear sixteen parts water by making use of warm water which i think always ought to be done and keeping it in a warm place if the weather be cold no difficulty will be found in fermenting it a little grounds of either small or strong beer will answer as well as yeast the few sheep and goats we had left were not likely to fare quite so well as ourselves there being no grass here but what was coarse and harsh it was however not so bad but that we expected they would devour it with great greediness and were the more surprised to find that they would not taste it nor did they seem over fond of the leaves of more tender plants upon examination we found their teeth loose and that many of them had every other symptom of an inveterate sea scurvy out of four ewes and two rams which i brought from the cape with an intent to put ashore in this country i had only been able to preserve one of each and even these were in so bad a state that it was doubtful if they could recover notwithstanding all the care possible had been taken of them some of the officers on the twenty eighth went up the bay in a small boat on a shooting party but discovering inhabitants they returned before noon to acquaint me therewith for hitherto we had not seen the least vestige of any they had but just got aboard when a canoe appeared off a point about a mile from us and soon after returned behind the point out of sight probably owing to a shower of rain which then fell for it was no sooner over than the canoe again appeared and came within musket shot of the ship there were in it seven or eight people they remained looking at us for some time and then returned all the signs of friendship we could make did not prevail on them to come nearer after dinner i took two boats and went in search of them in the cove where they were first seen accompanied by several of the officers and gentlemen we found the canoe at least a canoe hauled up on the shore near to two small huts where were several fireplaces some fishing nets a few fish lying on the shore and some in the canoe but we saw no people they probably had retired into the woods after a short stay and leaving in the canoe some medals looking-glasses beads etc we embarked and rowed to the head of the cove where we found nothing remarkable in turning back we put ashore at the same place as before but still saw no people however they could not be far off as we smelled the smoke of fire though we did not see it but i did not care to search further or to force an interview which they seemed to avoid well knowing that the way to obtain this was to leave the time and place to themselves it did not appear that anything i had left had been touched however i now added a hatchet and with the night returned on board on the twenty-ninth were showers till the afternoon when a party of the officers made an excursion up the bay and mr forster and his party were out botanizing both parties returned in the evening without meeting with anything worthy of notice and the two following days every one was confined to the ship on account of rainy stormy weather seventeen seventy three april in the afternoon of the first of april accompanied by several of the gentlemen i went to see if any of the articles i had left for the indians were taken away we found everything remaining in the canoe nor did it appear that anybody had been there since after shooting some birds one of which was a duck with a blue-gray plumage and soft bill we in the evening returned on board the second being a pleasant morning lieutenants clerk and edgecombe and the two mr forsters went in a boat up the bay to search for the productions of nature and myself lieutenant pickersgill and mr hodges went to take a view of the northwest side in our way we touched at the seal rock and killed three seals one of which afforded us much sport 
After passing several isles, we at length came to the most northern and western arms of the bay, the same as is formed by the land of Five Fingers Point. In the bottom of this arm or cove we found many ducks, wood hens, and other wild fowl, some of which we killed and returned on board at ten o'clock in the evening, where the other party had arrived several hours before us, after having had but indifferent sport. They took with them a black dog we had got at the Cape, who at the first musket they fired ran into the woods from whence he would not return. The three following days were rainy, so that no excursions were made. Early in the morning on the 6th a shooting party, made up of the officers, went to Goose Cove, the place where I was on the 2nd, and myself, accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters and Mr. Hodges, set out to continue the survey of the bay. My attention was directed to the north side, where I discovered a fine capacious cove, in the bottom of which is a freshwater river, on the west side several beautiful small cascades, and the shores are so steep that a ship might lie near enough to convey the water into her by a hose. In this cove we shot fourteen ducks besides other birds, which occasioned my calling it Duck Cove. As we returned in the evening we had a short interview with three of the natives, one man and two women. They were the first that discovered themselves on the north-east point of Indian Island, named so on this occasion. We should have passed without seeing them, had not the man hallooed to us. He stood with his club in his hand upon the point of a rock, and behind him, at the skirts of the wood, stood the two women, with each of them a spear. The man could not help discovering great signs of fear when we approached the rock with our boat. He, however, stood firm, nor did he move to take up some things we threw him ashore. At length I landed, went up and embraced him, and presented him with such articles as I had about me, which at once dissipated his fears. Presently after we were joined by the two women, the gentlemen that were with me, and some of the seamen. After this we spent about half an hour in chit-chat, little understood on either side, in which the youngest of the two women bore by far the greatest share. This occasioned one of the seamen to say that women do not want tongue in any part of the world. We presented them with fish and fowl which we had in our boat, but these they threw into the boat again, giving us to understand that such things they wanted not. Night approaching obliged us to take leave of them, when the youngest of the two women, whose volubility of tongue exceeded everything I ever met with, gave us a dance, but the man viewed us with great attention. Some hours after we got on board, the other party returned, having had but indifferent sport. Next morning I made the natives another visit, accompanied by Mr. Forster and Mr. Hodges, carrying with me various articles which I presented them with, and which they received with a great deal of indifference, except hatchets and spike-nails. These they most esteemed. This interview was at the same place as last night, and now we saw the whole family. It consisted of the man, his two wives, as we supposed, the young woman before mentioned, a boy about fourteen years old, and three small children, the youngest of which was at the breast. They were all well-looking except one woman, who had a large wen on her upper lip, which made her disagreeable, and she seemed on that account to be in a great measure neglected by the man. They conducted us to their habitation, which was but a little way within the skirts of the wood and consisted of two mean huts made of the bark of trees. Their canoe, which was a small double one, just large enough to transport the whole family from place to place, lay in a small creek near the huts. During our stay, Mr. Hodges made drawings of most of them. This occasioned them to give him the name of Toto, which word, we suppose, signifies marking or painting. When we took leave, the chief presented me with a piece of cloth 
or garment of their own manufacturing, and some other trifles. I at first thought it was meant as a return for the presents I had made him, but he soon undeceived me by expressing a desire for one of our boat cloaks. I took the hint, and ordered one to be made for him of red baize as soon as I got aboard, where rainy weather detained me the following day. The ninth being fair weather, we paid the natives another visit, and made known our approach by hallooing to them, but they neither answered us nor met us at the shore as usual. The reason of this we soon saw, for we found them at their habitations all dressed and dressing, in their very best, with their hair combed and oiled, tied upon the crowns of their heads and stuck with white feathers. Some wore a fillet of feathers round their heads, and all of them had bunches of white feathers stuck in their ears. Thus dressed and all standing, they had received us with great courtesy. I presented the chief with the cloak I had got made for him, with which he seemed so well pleased that he took his patapatu from his girdle and gave it me. After a short stay we took leave, and having spent the remainder of the day in continuing my survey of the bay, with a night returned on board. Very heavy rains falling on the two following days no work was done, but the twelfth proved clear and serene, and afforded us an opportunity to dry our sails and linen, two things very much wanted, not having had fair weather enough for this purpose since we put into this bay. Mr. Forster and his party also profited by the day in botanizing. About ten o'clock the family of the natives paid us a visit. Seeing that they approached the ship with great caution, I met them in a boat, which I quitted when I got to them, and went into their canoe. Yet after all, I could not prevail on them to put alongside the ship, and at last was obliged to leave them to follow their own inclination. At length they put ashore in a little creek hard by us, and afterwards came and sat down on the shore abreast of the ship, near enough to speak with us. I now caused the bagpipes and fife to play, and the drum to beat. The two first they did not regard, but the latter caused some little attention in them. Nothing, however, could induce them to come on board. But they entered with great familiarity into conversation, little understood, with such of the officers and seamen as went to them, paying much greater regard to some than to others, and these, we had reason to believe, they took for women. To one man in particular the young woman showed an extraordinary fondness until she discovered his sex, after which she would not suffer him to come near her. Whether it was that she before took him for one of her own sex, or that the man, in order to discover himself, had taken some liberties with her which she thus resented, I know not. In the afternoon I took Mr. Hodges to a large cascade, which falls from a high mountain on the south side of the bay, about a league above the place where we lay. He made a drawing of it on paper, and afterwards painted it in oil colours, which exhibits, at once, a better description of it than any I can give. Huge heaps of stones lay at the foot of this cascade, which had been broken off and brought by the stream from the adjacent mountains. These stones were of different sorts, none, however, according to Mr. Forster's opinion, whom I believe to be a judge, containing either minerals or metals. Nevertheless, I brought away specimens of every sort, as the whole country, that is, the rocky part of it, seemed to consist of those stones and no other. This cascade is at the east point of a cove, lying in southwest two miles, which I named Cascade Cove. In it is good anchorage and other necessaries. At the entrance lies an island, on each side of which is a passage that on the east side is much the widest. A little above the isle and near the southeast shore are two rocks which are covered at high water. It was in this cove we first saw the natives. When I returned aboard in the evening I found our friends the natives 
had taken up their quarters at about a hundred yards from our watering-place, a very great mark of the confidence they placed in us. This evening a shooting party of the officers went over to the north side of the bay, having with them the small cutter to convey them from place to place. Next morning, accompanied by Mr. Forster, I went in the pinnace to survey the isles and rocks which lie in the mouth of the bay. I began first with those which lie on the southeast side of Anchor Island. I found here a very snug cove sheltered from all winds, which we called Luncheon Cove, because here we dined on crayfish, on the side of a pleasant brook, shaded by the trees from both wind and sun. After dinner we proceeded, by rowing, out to the outermost isles, where we saw many seals, fourteen of which we killed and brought away with us, and might have got many more, if the surf had permitted us to land with safety on all the rocks. The next morning I went out again to continue the survey accompanied by Mr. Forster. I intended to have landed again on the Seal Isles, but there ran such a high sea that I could not come near them. With some difficulty we rowed out to sea and round the southwest point of Anchor Isle. It happened very fortunately that chance directed me to take this course, in which we found the sportsman's boat adrift, and laid hold of her the very moment she would have been dashed against the rocks. I was not long at a loss to guess how she came there, nor was I under any apprehensions for the gentleman that had been in her, and after refreshing ourselves with such as we had to eat and drink, and securing the boat in a small creek, we proceeded to the place where we supposed them to be. This we reached about seven or eight o'clock in the evening, and found them upon a small isle in Goose Cove, where, as it was low water, we could not come with our boat until the return of the tide. As this did not happen till three o'clock in the morning, we landed on a naked beach, not knowing where to find a better place, and after some time, having got a fire and broiled some fish, we made a hearty supper, having for sauce a good appetite. This done we lay down to sleep, having a stony beach for a bed, and the canopy of heaven for a covering. At length the tide permitted us to take off the sportsmen, and with them we embarked and proceeded for the place where we had left their boat, which we saw and reached, having a fresh breeze of wind in our favour attended with rain. When we came to the creek which was on the north-west side of Anchor Isle, we found there an immense number of blue petrels, some on the wing, others in the woods in holes in the ground, under the roots of trees and in the crevices of rocks, where there was no getting them, and where we supposed their young were deposited. As not one was to be seen in the day, the old ones were probably at that time out at sea searching for food, which in the evening they bring to the air young. The noise they made was like the croaking of many frogs. They were, I believe, of the broad-bill kind, which are not so commonly seen at sea as the others. Here, however, they were in great numbers, and flying much about in the night, some of our gentlemen at first took them for bats. After restoring the sportsmen to their boat, we all proceeded for the ship, which we reached by seven o'clock in the morning, not a little fatigued with our expedition. I now learned that our friends the natives returned to their habitation at night, probably foreseeing that rain was at hand, which sort of weather continued the whole of this day. On the morning of the 15th, the weather having cleared up and become fair, I set out with two boats to continue the survey of the northwest side of the bay, accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters and several of the officers, whom I detached in one boat to Goose Cove, where we intended to lodge the night, while I proceeded in the other, examining the harbours and isles which lay in my way. In the doing of this, I picked up about a score of wild fowl and caught fish sufficient to serve the whole party, and reaching the place of rendezvous a little before dark, I found all the gentlemen out duck shooting. They, however, soon returned, not overloaded with game. By this time the cooks had done their parts, in which little art was required, and after a hearty repast on what the day had produced, we lay down to rest. 
but took care to rise early the next morning, in order to have the other bout among the ducks before we left the cove. Accordingly, at daylight, we prepared for the attack. Those who had reconnoitred the place before chose their stations accordingly, whilst myself and another remained in the boat, and rowed to the head of the cove to start the game, which we did so effectually that, out of some scores of ducks, we only detained one to ourselves, sending all the rest down to those stationed below. After this I landed at the head of the cove, and walked across the narrow isthmus that disjoins it from the sea, or rather from another cove which runs in from the sea about one mile, and lies open to the north winds. It, however, had all the appearance of a good harbour and safe anchorage. At the head is a fine sandy beach, where I found an immense number of wood-hens, and brought away ten couple of them, which recompensed me for the trouble of crossing the isthmus, through the wet woods up to the middle in water. About nine o'clock we all got collected together, when the success of every one was known, which was by no means answerable to our expectations. The morning, indeed, was very unfavourable for shooting, being rainy the most of the time we were out. After breakfast we set out on our return to the ship, which we reached by seven o'clock in the evening, with about seven dozen of wild fowl and two seals, the most of them shot while I was rowing about, exploring the harbours and coves which we found in my way, every place affording something, especially to us, to whom nothing came amiss. It rained all the 17th but the 18th, bringing fair and clear weather. In the evening our friends, the natives before mentioned, paid us another visit, and the next morning the chief and his daughter were induced to come on board, while the others went out in the canoe fishing. Before they came on board, I showed them our goats and sheep that were on shore, which they viewed for a moment with a kind of stupid insensibility. After this I conducted them to the brow, but before the chief set his foot upon it to come into the ship, he took a small green branch in his hand, with which he struck the ship's side several times, repeating a speech or prayer. When this was over, he threw the branch into the main chains, and came on board. This manner and custom of making peace, as it were, is practised by all the nations in the South Seas that I have seen. End of Book One, Chapter Four, Part One Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Chapter Four, Part Two of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Four Transactions in Dusky Bay with an Account of Several Interviews with the Inhabitants. Part Two. I took them both down into the cabin where we were to breakfast. They sat at table with us, but would not taste any of our victuals. The chief wanted to know where we slept, and indeed to pry into every corner of the cabin, every part of which he viewed with some surprise. But it was not possible to fix his attention to any one thing a single moment. The works of art appeared to him in the same light as those of nature, and were as far removed beyond his comprehension. What seemed to strike them most was the number and strength of our decks and other parts of the ship. The chief, before he came aboard, presented me with a piece of cloth and a green talc hatchet. To Mr. Forster he also gave a piece of, of cloth, and the girl gave another to Mr. Hodges. This custom of making presents before they receive any is common with the natives of the South Sea Isles, but I never saw it practised in New Zealand before. Of all the various articles I gave my guest, hatchets and spike nails were the most valuable in his eyes. These he would never suffer to go out of his hands after he once laid hold of them, 
whereas many other articles he would lay carelessly down anywhere, and at last leave them behind him. As soon as I could get quit of them, they were conducted into the gun-room where I left them, and set out with two boats to examine the head of the bay, myself in one accompanied by Mr. Forster and Mr. Hodges, and Lieutenant Cooper in the other. We proceeded up the south side, and without meeting with anything remarkable, got to the head of the bay by sunset, where we took up our lodging for the night, at the first place we could land upon, for the flats hindered us from getting quite to the head. At daylight in the morning I took two men in the small boat, and with Mr. Forster went to take a view of the flat land at the head of the bay, near to where we spent the night. We landed on one side and ordered the boat to meet us on the other side, but had not been long on shore before we saw some ducks which, by their creeping through the bushes, we got a shot at and killed one. The moment we had fired, the natives, whom we had not discovered before, set up a most hideous noise in two or three places close by us. We hallooed in our turn, and at the same time retired to our boat, which was full half a mile off. The natives kept up their clamouring noise, but did not follow us. Indeed, we found afterwards that they could not, because of a branch of the river between us and them, nor did we find their number as answerable to the noise they made. As soon as we got to our boat, and found that there was a river that would admit us, I rowed in, and was soon after joined by Mr. Cooper in the other boat. With this reinforcement I proceeded up the river, shooting wild ducks, of which there were great numbers, as we went along, now and then hearing the natives in the woods. At length two appeared on the banks of the river, a man and a woman, and the latter kept waving something white in her hand as a sign of friendship. Mr. Cooper being near them, I called to him to land, as I wanted to take the advantage of the tide to get up as high as possible, which did not much exceed half a mile, when I was stopped by the strength of the stream and great stones that lay in the bed of the river. On my return I found that as Mr. Cooper did not land when the natives expected him, they had retired into the woods, but two others now appeared on the opposite bank. I endeavoured to have an interview with them, but this I could not effect, for as I approached the shore they always retired farther into the woods, which were so thick as to cover them from our sight. The falling tide obliged me to retire out of the river to the place where we had spent the night. There we breakfasted, and afterwards embarked, in order to return on board. But, just as we were going, we saw two men on the opposite shore, hallooing to us, which induced me to row over to them. I landed with two others, unarmed, the two natives standing about one hundred yards from the water-side, with each a spear in his hand. When we three advanced they retired, but stood when I advanced alone. It was some little time before I could prevail upon them to lay down their spears. This at last one of them did, and met me with a grass plant in his hand, one end of which he gave me to hold, while he held the other. Standing in this manner he began a speech, not one word of which I understood, and made some long pauses, waiting, as I thought, for me to answer for when I spoke he proceeded. As soon as this ceremony was over, which was not long, we saluted each other. He then took out his hahu, or coat, from off his own back and put it upon mine, after which peace seemed firmly established. More people joining us did not in the least alarm them, on the contrary they saluted every one as he came up. I gave to each a hatchet and a knife, having nothing else with me. Perhaps these were the most valuable things I could give them, at least they were the most useful. They wanted us to go to their habitation, telling us they would give us something to eat, and I was sorry that the tide and other circumstances would not permit me to accept of their invitation. More people were seen in the skirts of the wood, but none of them joined us. 
Probably these were their wives and children. When we took leave, they followed us to our boat, and seeing the muskets lying across the stern, they made signs for them to be taken away, which being done, they came alongside and assisted us to launch her. At this time it was necessary for us to look well after them, for they wanted to take away everything they could lay their hands upon, except the muskets. These they took care not to touch, being taught, by the slaughter they had seen us make among the wild fowl, to look upon them as instruments of death. We saw no canoes or other boats with them. Two or three logs of wood tied together served the same purpose, and were indeed sufficient for the navigation of the river, on the banks of which they lived. Their fish and fowl were in such plenty, that they had no occasion to go far for food, and they have but few neighbours to disturb them. The whole number at this place, I believe, does not exceed three families. It was noon when we took leave of these two men, and proceeded down the north side of the bay, which I explored in my way, and the isles that lie in the middle. Night, however, overtook us, and obliged me to leave one arm unlooked into, and hasten to the ship, which we reached by eight o'clock. I then learned that the man and his daughter stayed on board the day before till noon, and that having understood from our people what things were left in Cascade Cove, the place where they were first seen, he sent and took them away. He and his family remained near us till to-day, when they all went off, and we saw them no more, which was the more extraordinary, as he never left us empty-handed. From one or another he did not get less than nine or ten hatchets, three or four times that number of large spike-nails, besides many other articles. So far as these things may be counted riches in New Zealand, he exceeds every man there, being at this time possessed of more hatchets and axes than are in the whole country besides. In the afternoon of the 21st I went with a party out to the isles on seal-hunting. The surf ran so high that we could only land in one place, where we killed ten. These animals served us for three purposes. The skins we made use of for our rigging, the fat gave oil for our lamps, and the flesh we eat. Their haslets are equal to that of a hog, and the flesh of some of them eats little inferior to beefsteaks. The following day nothing worthy of notice was done. On the morning of the 23rd, Mr. Pickersgill, Mr. Gilbert, and two others went to the Cascade Cove, in order to ascend one of the mountains, the summit of which they reached by two o'clock in the afternoon, as we could see by the fire they made. In the evening they returned on board, and reported that inland nothing was to be seen but barren mountains, with huge craggy precipices, disjoined by valleys, or rather chasms, frightful to behold. On the south-east side of Cape West, four miles out at sea, they discovered a ridge of rocks, on which the waves broke very high. I believe these rocks to be the same we saw the evening we first fell in with the land. Having five geese left out of those we brought from the Cape of Good Hope, I went with them next morning to Goose Cove, named so on this account, where I left them. I chose this place for two reasons. First, there are no inhabitants to disturb them, and secondly, here being the most food, I make no doubt that they, they will breed and may in time spread over the whole country, and fully answer my intention in leaving them. We spent the day shooting in and about the cove, and returned aboard about ten o'clock in the evening. One of the party shot a white hern, which agreed exactly with Mr. Pennant's description, in his British zoology, of the white herns that either now are, or were formerly, in England. The twentieth was the eighth fair day, we had had, successively, a circumstance, I believe, very uncommon in this place, especially at this season of the year. 
This fair weather gave us an opportunity to complete our wood and water, to overhaul the rigging, caulk the ship, and put her in a condition for sea. Fair weather was, however, now at an end, for it began to rain this evening, and continued without intermission till noon the next day, when we cast off the shore fasts, hove the ship out of the creek to her anchor, and steadied her with an oarsor to the shore. On the twenty-seventh, hazy weather with showers of rain. In the morning I set out, accompanied by Mr. Pickersgill and the two Mr. Forsters, to explore the arm or inlet I discovered the day I returned from the head of the bay. After rowing about two leagues up it, or rather down, I found it to communicate with the sea, and to afford a better outlet for ships bound to the north than the one I came in by. After making this discovery, and refreshing ourselves on broiled fish and wild fowl, we set out for the ship, and got on board at eleven o'clock at night, leaving two arms we had discovered, and which ran into the east unexplored. In this expedition we shot forty-four birds, sea-pies, ducks, etc., without going one foot out of our way, or causing any other delay than picking them up. Having got the tents and every other article on board on the 28th, we only now waited for a wind to carry us out of the harbour, and through a new passage, the way I proposed to go to sea. Everything being removed from the shore, I set fire to the top wood, etc., in order to dry a piece of the ground we had occupied, which next morning I dug up and sowed with several sorts of garden seeds. The soil was such as did not promise success to the planter. It was, however, the best we could find. At two o'clock in the afternoon we weighed with a light breeze at south-west, and stood up the bay for the new passage. Soon after we had got through, between the east end of Indian Island and the west end of Long Island, it fell calm, which obliged us to anchor in forty-three fathom water, under the north side of the latter island. In the morning of the 30th we weighed again with a light breeze at west, which, together with all our boats ahead towing, was hardly sufficient to stem the current. For, after struggling till six o'clock in the evening, and not getting more than five miles from our last anchoring place, we anchored under the north side of Long Island, not more than one hundred yards from the shore, to which we fastened a hawser. 1773, May. At daylight next morning, May 1st, we got again under sail and attempted to work to windward, having a light breeze down the bay. At first we gained ground, but at last the breeze died away, when we soon lost more than we had got, and were obliged to bear up for a cove on the north side of Long Island, where we anchored in nineteen fathom water a muddy bottom. In this cove we found two huts not long since inhabited, and near them two very large fireplaces or ovens, such as they have in the Society Isles. In this cove we were detained by calms, attended with continual rain, till the fourth in the afternoon, when, with the assistance of a small breeze at south-west, we got the length of the reach or passage leading to sea. The breeze then left us, and we anchored under the east point, before a sandy beach, in thirty fathoms water. But this anchoring place hath nothing to recommend it, like the one we came from, which hath everything in its favour. In the night we had some very heavy squalls of wind, attended with rain, hail and snow, and some thunder. Daylight exhibited to our view all the hills and mountains covered with snow. At two o'clock in the afternoon a light breeze sprung up at south-south-west, which, with the help of our boats, carried us down the passage to our intended anchor-place, where at eight o'clock we anchored in sixteen fathoms water, and moored with a hawser to the shore, under the first point on the starboard side as you come in from sea, from which we were covered by the point. In the morning on the 6th I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill 
accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters, to explore the second arm which turns into the east, myself being confined on board by a cold. At the same time I had everything got up from between decks, the decks well cleaned and well aired with fires, a thing that ought never to be long neglected in wet, moist weather. The fair weather, which had continued all this day, was succeeded in the night by a storm from northwest, which blew in hard squalls, attended with rain, and obliged us to strike top-gallant and lower yards, and to carry out another hawser to the shore. The bad weather continued the whole day and the succeeding night, after which it fell calm with fair weather. At seven o'clock in the morning on the eighth, Mr. Pickersgill returned, together with his companions, in no very good plight, having been at the head of the arm he was sent to explore, which he judged to extend in to the eastward about eight miles. In it is a good anchoring place, wood, fresh water, wild fowl and fish. At nine o'clock I set out to explore the other inlet, or the one next the sea, and ordered Mr. Gilbert, the master, to go and examine the passage out to sea, while those on board were getting everything in readiness to depart. I proceeded up the inlet till five o'clock in the afternoon, when bad weather obliged me to return before I had seen the end of it. As this inlet lay nearly parallel with the sea coast, I was of opinion that it might communicate with Doubtful Harbour, or some other inlet to the northward. Appearances were, however, against this opinion, and the bad weather hindered me from determining the point, although a few hours would have done it. I was about ten miles up, and thought I saw the end of it. I found on the north side three coves in which, as also on the south side, between the main and the isles that lie four miles up the inlet, is good anchorage. Wood, water, and what else can be expected, such as fish and wild fowl. Of the latter we killed in this excursion three dozen. After a very hard row, against both wind and rain, we got on board about nine o'clock at night, without a dry thread on our backs. This bad weather continued no longer than till the next morning, when it became fair, and the sky cleared up. But, as we had not wind to carry us to sea, we made up two shooting parties, myself accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters and some others, went to the area I was in the day before, and the other party to the coves and isles Mr. Gilbert had discovered when he was out, and where he found many wild fowl. We had a pleasant day, and the evening brought us all on board. Myself and party met with good sport, but the other party found little. All the forenoon of the tenth we had strong gales from the west, attended with heavy showers of rain, and blowing in such flurries over high land, as made it unsafe for us to get under sail. The afternoon was more moderate and became fair, when myself, Mr. Cooper, and some others, went out in the boat to the rocks, which lie at the entrance of the bay, to kill seals. The weather was rather unfavourable for this sport, and the sea ran high, so as to make landing difficult. We, however, killed ten, but could only wait to bring away five, with which we returned on board. In the morning of the eleventh, while we were getting under sail, I sent a boat for the other five seals. At nine o'clock we weighed with a light breeze at south-east, and stood out to sea, taking up the boat in our way. It was noon before we got clear of the land, at which time we observed in forty-five degrees, thirty-four minutes, thirty seconds south. The entrance of the bay bore south-east by east, and breaks the isles, the outermost isles that lie at the south point of the entrance of the bay, bore south-south-east, distant three miles. The southernmost point, or that of Five Fingers Point, bore south forty-two degrees west, and the northernmost land north-northeast. In this situation we had a prodigious swell from the south-west, which broke with great violence on all the shores that were exposed to it. End of Book One Chapter Four Part Two 
Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts.